Welcome to Compass Church. It's great to see you all today. Uh, let's see what we got going on. So, in we count today, four Sundays, we will be in the new space, which is super exciting. So, we have today, and then two more weeks here, and then we'll be there. So, make sure you're on the sixth not to come here, which is easy. It's just the first Sunday of October. So, it's you know, when September's done. But the day before that, on the fifth, we're going to have a prayer walk at the new building. And so we're going to go, we're going to meet at 10 a.m. at the new building, and then we're going to walk around the neighborhood. It's kind of like behind it. We're going to pray for the neighborhood, pray for what God's going to do for Compass Church, in Compass Church, through Compass Church. So make sure you have both those things. One's at 10, and church 10.30. So just remember, you know, be at church at 10. You'll, you'll be good for that weekend. Um, make sure you're connected to us on social media, following us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, make sure you're getting our emails, all those good things. Uh, we started our Bible study this last week on Miracles in the Old Testament. We had a great time talking about water and the things that God does through water in the Old Testament. So join us this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Not here at Elevate and uh, come and continue that with us as well. And uh, so giving, you can give online. We're still giving. Um, through northwestfmc.org slash give, or if you just go to the new Compass Church, wichita.com, there's a give button right there too. Uh, and then you can also give physically. Uh, if you're writing checks, they'll make those out to Northwest FMC. We will let you know when to switch over. All right. As we move into worship, I'm going to invite you to stand. Uh, posture is important, so... Standing is good. If you feel like kneeling, if you feel like God's calling you to sit, that's cool too. But let's um, enter our time of worship and our call of worship. Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. Continue to worship your singing. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> well, today's definitely a great Sunday. Thank you all are awake, hopefully. <laughs> let's, start, get, let's get it started. Let's worship on this Sunday morning. Amen. I'm glad to be here. I might be gone for the next couple weeks, and I'll explain why um, in a little bit, but let's just get to worship. Amen. I could just sit.
as we enter in our song of prayer, I ask that you take whatever position is comfortable for you, whether it be standing, kneeling, or sitting. When I picked these songs, it was kind of last minute because I was doing a lot of homework and all that. And then when I looked at them this morning, I was like, man, this is a really great selection. Knowing that God, God called us higher, to a higher order. Knowing that when our, we sing our soul out, our Savior, our God, is there to greet us. And He's just there waiting for us. Knowing that our God is good to us, and age to age that we stand, the time is in his hands. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. In age to age, he stands. And time is in his hands. Even though it's like a small little ten-word sentence, it speaks a lot. And it speaks a lot. You know, quite frankly, time is what brought us together. The time that I was in a low spot without going to church for about three years and being able to come back into a new world, into a new light. At any age, he's able to stand with us. No matter who you are, no matter what you look like, he stands with you all the way. Having that support, having that trust, and him seeing the vision for your vision, that's powerful. That's beyond love. And my own life, he really feels, checks off every box that he needs. Anytime you have a low moment, he's there. Anytime you're happy and singing to God, he's there. Anytime you're just looking at the world, seeing the trees and the beautiful birds, he's right there.
don't have put your hands up high. But let him feel your praise. Filled with wonder, lost with wonder. children will hopefully be on better behavior this week than they, they, they were going to take two on this same story.
Jesus brought us all together in peace. We are different from each other, but we are one people. Jesus broke down the wall of hate between us when he died on the cross. He brought peace between us and God. Jesus' words of peace are for everyone. Who are they for? Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. everyone. Everyone can share peace because of Jesus. Okay, now listen, this is really important. All the people can come to God because of Jesus and God's Spirit. Now you aren't strangers anymore. You are members of God's family. We are like a house. God used the prophets and apostles to build a foundation. Jesus is the most important stone, that, the one that holds the whole house together. You are being made into a house where God lives through the Spirit. So, we can live in peace with our family. We can live in peace with our church. We can live in peace with everyone, right? And that's what God wants us to do. I have to read that one later. So let's go ahead and pray that this week. I don't know. We're going to pray that this week, even if we don't have peace with someone, we disagree that we can find it because we're part of God's family, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to get my pies. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for the chance to hear about your word. Thank you, God, for making us a family. We pray that you help us to love each other even when it's challenging. We ask that you help us to love others we don't know and to help them be part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you join us this morning. Uh, we are continuing our series on faith and politics. Uh, last week we started this and we talked about how this series is not to influence you on how to vote, but to look at the biblical text and see how politics impact the Bible and if there are any lessons we can learn from these things. Um, and so last week we talked about Israel uh, fleeing Egypt and how God uses the politics of a, of a theocracy to get his people to move forward. And how the point of the text is still, even from a political lens, to free the people from captivity that Egypt has created and abused people through. Um, this week we are moving into the book of Judges and we are going to look at the politics of Judges. Uh, Judges is the first time that we see Israel exist as a nation with a, with a, with a set boundary. Uh, previously, they were under captivity in Egypt. Uh, they existed in the desert, but it wasn't really theirs. They were wandering through. Um, and before the captivity in Egypt, it was just one family, uh, Jacob. Um, and before that, it was individuals relating to a larger uh, family system. So you have um, you have Abraham, and it's kind of his family. So it's kind of narrow in scope. So Judges is the first time outside of Moses that the Israelites must figure out how to live with with one another in a defined space. Uh, this results loose in a loosely affiliated tribal federation. Um, so th these don't really exist anymore in our modern world. There's no singular nation that is loosely made up of smaller tribes that are family-oriented in today's modern politics. Um, I think the closest analogy from the last 300 years would be the 13 colonies. They're loosely affiliated. They have their own political structure within them as a colony. Uh, so you, in Virginia, you have the, Assembly of Virgin the, the House Assembly of Virginia, who makes laws for Virginia, and then as they, uh, together, the political structure determines how they engage with one another. And so they coalesce around a common threat, and in, uh, this is a little civics and history lesson for you, but it was taxation of that representation was the common threat that they decided to merge together around. And so we see this in the book of Joshua, or at the beginning of the book of Joshua, 
is how Israel begins to operate as a tribal federation. So the tribes are given an inheritance of land of Canaan, and from that land they operate mostly independently from one another. Um, and so we're going to be in, start in Joshua 14, 1 through 5. It says, The Israelites received these inheritances in the land of Canaan. Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the family of the Israelite tribes assigned them. Their legacy was assigned by Lot, exactly as the Lord had commanded the nine and a half tribes through Moses. In fact, Moses had given up the legacy of the two and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan, but he gave no legacy among them to the Levites. The people of Joseph consisted of two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. The Levites weren't given any portion of the land except cities to live in and pasture land for their cattle and flocks. The Israelites divided up the land exactly as the Lord had commanded Moses. So, the beginning of this section, and, or the beginning of this understanding of a tribal federation, right? The heads of the tribes gather together and they break up the land according to the legacy left by Moses. Um, in in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, in Numbers, um, and so we see that the land has been a set, defi- has been defined set for what it means to be an Israelite tribe. And so as a tribe, you have your set of land, and you decide what happens within that set of land. The Levites don't get any set of land because they're supposed to be the priestly uh, tribe. Um, And so we begin to see that in the beginning of Judges, each tribe is meant to drive out the people in their lands. And we see that some tribes don't do what they're called to do of forcing the people out. So this is in Judges uh, 1, it, uh, verses 27 through, through 36. It says, The tribe of Manasseh didn't drive out the people of Bashim, Tanakh, Dor, Iblim, Megiddo, or any of their villages. The Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work for them, but they didn't completely drive them out. The tribe of Ephraim didn't drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, so the Canaanites kept on living there with them. The tribe of Zebulon didn't drive out the people living in Kitron or Nahalo. These Canaanites lived with them, but were forced to work for them. The tribe of Asher didn't drive out the people living in Echo, Sidon, Alab, Akit, Agzi, Helba, Afik, Reho. I, well, uh, I'm sorry. I choose these passages, and then I realize that I have to say these names out loud. And so, uh, anyway, uh, the people of Asher settled among the Canaanites. In the land because they couldn't drive them out. The tribe of Naphtali didn't drive out the people living in Beth Shemesh, Beth Anath, but settled among the, Can- among the Canaanites in the land. The people living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath were forced to work for them. The Amorites pushed the people of Dan back into the highlands because they wouldn't allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites were determined to live in Harharis, Ajalon, and Shalbim, but Joseph's household became strong and the Amorites were forced to work for them. The border of the Amorites ran from Akrabim Pass, from Selah, and upward. And so these tribes are supposed to, on their own accord, drive out the people who are living there. Um, And they fail to do that, and they fail what they're supposed to do. Uh, And so you can begin to see how if these people who they're supposed to drive out in the land start to live amongst them, how complex politically the Israelite tribes begin to get. Um, and so they are bonded together as one nation, and each tribe has to do what they are meant to be doing. And yet they don't do that, and they have Canaanites living amongst them. And so we see pretty quickly that the political landscape moves from success to trouble in the book of Judges. So this is in Judges 2. Uh, when Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites each went to settle on their own family property in order to take possession of the land. The people served the Lord throughout the rest of Joshua's life and throughout the next generation of elders who outlived him. Those who had seen all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel, Joshua, Nun's son, and the Lord's servant died when he was 110 years old. They buried him within the boundary of his family property in Timnath Perez in the highlands of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. When the whole generation had passed away, Another generation came after them who didn't know the Lord or the things that he had done for Israel. Right? So Joshua's passing, and then the next generation is that they they don't remember what God has done for them in the Exodus. And so they start doing whatever they desire. They start making 
uh, idols of other gods, of the, of the nations that still live amongst them. And the nation is ended up leading into sin by the tribes, and the Lord uh, works against them in, in, in the text. It says that they go out to battle and they don't win, so they have to come back, and they try to go back out to battle again. The Lord isn't with them, and they come back. And so there's this problem that the Israelites are facing politically. They are supposed to occupy the land, they're supposed to own this land, and yet they're not doing it. They're not living out the intention that God had set for them. Israel was supposed to be a nation that shined a light and showed how to live properly with God in the land promised to them. But Israel could not even get the land situated correctly. And then, when their leader Joshua passes, and the generations that knew of the things of God passes, they decide that God really isn't worth it, and start leading their own way. And so then the rest of the book of Judges is this, the people of Israel deciding to sin against God, a prophet being called, a judge being called up to protect and, and uh, protect against an existential threat, then living in peace for a while, and then falling away again. Um, and so God has to respond to the sins of Israel, and he does this by raising up judges, singular leaders who lead the people out of the threat they are facing. The model judge is Othniel, but then you get other judges such as Deborah or Gideon. Uh, and all of these judges are called out from within the tribes, and these judges become temporary leaders that pull Israel out of crisis, and typically, not always, but typically, lead them to worshiping God. Um, there are judges who are, it's kind of who you expect it to be. There are judges who are, it is not expected uh, who it would be. And there are sometimes outsiders or unlikely people. In the story of Jephthah, who's a judge, he's, he's an outsider to his own family. And they realize he has gathered up a kind of a gang of men to protect his own kind of thing that he had settled. And so the elders of his family go to him and they say, hey, there's this, there's this threat to us as, as a nation. Will you lead our people? And Jephthah being an outsider, eventually agrees to, to this. And he is only a judge for six years in the story of Judges. And so God moves through these political moments and uses them to call out people into leading. But it was because of their moral failure. Without a leader, that God would have to call up these judges. Throughout the stories in Judges, the politics are complex. And the stories woven throughout this period grow darker and darker the longer they exist within this tribal federation political structure. Because the tribes are deciding for themselves um, what they should be doing. And people seize power that they should not have and use it to commit horrible acts of violence upon their own people. We see this with Abimelech um, in Judges after Gideon. He, he kills his brothers because he's, he wants to seize the power of Israel. This culminates at the end of the book of Judges where Israel enters into a civil war between the tribes. So, if this is a predominantly dark period with a few bright spots, what are we supposed to make of this? Is a tribal federation a bad way to organize yourself politically? Like I said last week, I don't think that God is setting a specific political agenda, but it does reveal something important about what happens when the politics of a nation become darker and darker. At the beginning of the book of Judges, there's a small story about a woman asking for a better plot of land. This is in Judges 1, verses 12 through 15. Caleb said, I'll give my daughter Aksa to a wife as a wife to the one who defeats and captures Kiriath Sephir. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. So Caleb gave him his daughter Aksa as a wife. When she arrived, she convinced Othniel to ask her father for a certain piece of land. As she got down from her donkey, Caleb said to her, What do you want? Aksa said to Caleb, Give me a gift, since you give me land in the southern plain. Give me springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. This story is set within a larger story of the conquest of the land by Israel, but it showcases a type of response and expectation that the people of Israel should get within how God has set them 
apart. There are some complications in this text. The expectation of the daughter as property or prize to be given away. But, prim, but Apsa steps outside of her role and demands not only property, but then water for her property for her and her husband. The demand is twofold in this story, and it shows the ability of women to step out of the role that was assigned to her or for her without repercussion. Caleb relents, and within the political and spiritual atmosphere, it is accepted for her to challenge the role that she was put into. Caleb is really kind of setting her up for failure, and Oxus says, this isn't right, you haven't, he kind of shames, she shames her father into giving her better, into giving some water access. But as the narrative of Judges continues, and the political identity of Israel starts to fracture and break, and people more and more decide what to do is right in their own eyes, as the end of Judges says, it moves into darker and darker territory. Uh, I'm going to preface this section of the sermon with a, with a, a bit of a content warning. I'm going to keep this uh, PG as possible, but really the story is NC-17. Um, so if you want to read it without the like uh, paraphrasing that I'm about to do of the story, I would encourage you to read... Uh, Judges 20 and 21, if you want to understand where, uh, a little more of a textual layering of this text. Um, um, and so I think one, it's a bit unavoidable, this text is really crucial to the understanding of Judges as a whole. And so at the end of Judges, a Levite man with a second wife uh, has that wife leave him and return to her father. The man goes to retrieve this wife of his, and in the process of retrieval, she dies at the hands of the, tri of the tribe of Benjamin. This death is not good, and it comes at the hands of some severe abuse. This man, this Levite man, decides to tell all of the tribes of Israel what has happened to his second wife. The tribes of Israel then respond to this outrage over the death of this woman at the hands of another tribe of Israel, by gathering up and attacking the tribe of Benjamin. The spiral of this episode continues when the Israelites have regret over what they have done in trying to eliminate the tribe of Benjamin by killing them. They have, they have taken a sworn oath to the Lord that they will not allow people to marry, they will not allow their daughters to marry any, anyone who is left of the tribe of Benjamin. But they feel a bit guilty about this, and so they come up with a solution. Any of the tribes that did not join in the war, they will kill and take wives for the, for, ben, for the tribe of Benjamin because they feel bad about eliminating the tribe. And so uh, they, they go and do this, and this whole episode centers on the impacts of marginalized people in a time of unhealthy politics and spirituality. But begin, compare this episode at the end of Judges with the beginning of Judges. A woman goes to her husband and says, demand this land from my father. When she receives arid land, she then goes to her father herself and asks for access to water. Aksa, as a woman, is, if not respected, at least honored in her asking. By the end period of Judges, there is no way that Aksa would be able to ask that question to her father. The role of women at this point in the story of Israel has deteriorated to the point of only seeing them in an exploitative light. The politics of Israel allow this. All the leaders of the tribe of Benjamin decide that kidnapping women for the Benjamites is a good and acceptable way to organize their affairs. At no point do they ask the Lord, should they do this thing? They go and offer sacrifice because they feel guilty about what they have done, but they don't ask the Lord, and they don't seek His uh, will, and is this the right thing to do? The, this is what it says in uh, Judges 21. It says, The Israelites had made a pledge of Mizpah, declaring none of us will allow his daughter to marry a Benjaminite. But the people came to Bethel and sat there until the evening before God, raising their voices and crying bitterly, Lord God of Israel, they said, Why has this happened among us? that as of today one tribe will be missing from Israel. And the next day the people got up early and built an altar there. They offered entirely burnt offerings and well-being sacrifices. In the lead-up to this battle, at no point did they seek 
to ask the Lord whether they should go fight the Benjaminites. The question is, who should attack first? What tribe should lead the charge? The whole battle narrative is complicated and in many ways unnecessary. The Benjamites should have done what God called them to offer hospitality to this Levite man. This whole narrative section is the hallmark of a community and a society in total collapse with one another. They turn to violence, they decide that women are no more than commodities to be traded with one another, and they see them only as property, not as co-image bearers of God. And this narrative at the end of Judges shows how God has become secondary for his people. When we look at this compared to the Gospel of Jesus, it should give us pause. Multiple times, Jesus promotes or preserves the dignity of those who are seen as less than in society. In Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, we have the story of the little children coming to Jesus. People were bringing children to Jesus so that he would bless them. But the disciples scolded them. When Jesus saw this, he grew angry and said to them, Allow the little children to come to me. Don't forbid them, because God's kingdom belongs to people like these children. I assure you that whoever doesn't welcome God's kingdom like, like a child will never enter it. Then he hugged the children and blessed them. We see Jesus and a woman who has a bad reputation be protected and welcomed by Jesus to honor him. In Luke 7, 36-39, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. After he entered the Pharisee's home, he took his place at the table. Meanwhile, a woman from the city, a sinner, discovered that Jesus was dining in the Pharisee's house. She brought perfumed oil and a vase made of alabaster. Standing behind him at his feet and crying, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the oil on them. When the Pharisee had invited Jesus to saw what was happening, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. He would know that she is a sinner. Throughout the, the Gospels, we see that Jesus protects and or heals those who are considered second-class citizens. Part of the the coming and blessing of Jesus is that he comes to do exactly what the Father wishes. We're going to get more into the specifics of Jesus and the politics facing Jesus later on. But I wanted to contrast the actions of Israel attempting to live out the law and how dissimilar it is to Jesus actually living out the law. So what does this mean for us? If the politics of this tribal federation is really everybody doing what they want until God raises up a prophet to deal with an existential threat. How do we use this? What does this teach us about following God? One of the main things that stands out from this tribal federation period is how much the people relied upon heroes to do the right thing. Oftentimes we look at our own lives this way. Where is the hero? Where is the one that God has sent for us to be delivered out of this existential threat? Where is the person who will lead us? I think this is the wrong position for us to take from this narrative of Judges. Judges should have been a time when people lived out with peace with one another and committed to their covenant with God. This is what everything in Exodus was leading up to. This was the land flowing with milk and honey that was promised to Israel. But Israel decides their positions or their neighbor's gods are more important than their own. One of the dangers we face as a, the people of God is that we can end up exactly like Israel, waiting for heroes rather than living out our covenant with God. The question we can take from this is, do I want to be a passive participant, waiting for a hero to save me, or should I live out the commands of Jesus for the good of my neighbor and the good of my community? The second thing I want to highlight in this narrative is the political nature of how marginalized people end up in the book of Judges. I highlighted how the role of women shifts dramatically in the story of Judges. From a place of maybe not co-equality, because Israel is still an ancient and patriarchal culture, but it does shift to one that is completely eliminates the voice of the vulnerable in their society. At the end of Judges, women have truly become commodities with no voice and no agency. This, to me, is a clear sign of the spiritual and political health of Israel as a nation. We should know and we should take to heart from Judges that when uh, 
that nations and people are in danger when they mistreat, oppress, and deny the image of God in the weakest among them. When thinking about how this affects us, we should be weary of anybody, politician or not, who punches down upon those weakest in society. The Gospels of Jesus are a reminder, and the stories of Jesus are a reminder, that the weakest in the story were often the most celebrated. Let the little children come to me, letting the sinner touch his feet, healing those who are sick and injured. I think we need to be reminded, especially when it comes to how we handle our affairs publicly or with societal issues, that when people who are the weakest are being pushed down and blamed and disregarded and treated as commodities, not as humans, we should remember that Christians were not always at the top of society. And when Christians were that group that was under and marginalized, they were martyred, they were enslaved, there were falsehoods that were spread against us. And so now, we have a responsibility to make sure that those things are not said or done towards people who bear the image of the same God that we worship. The story of, and the, narr the whole narrative of Judges, highlights how sometimes the politics of the world end up being problematic. And it should encourage us to care for our community. And how when everyone decides what is right in their own eye, it leads to the commodification of people who are the weakest in society. Do you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you that you are present with us and that through the narrative of Judges and through the Gospels of Jesus, you remind us that you have called us to love our neighbor as ourself. You have called us to care for one another, to see the most vulnerable and welcome them in. We pray that you would give us this reminder on a daily basis that it is not right that we do whatever we think is right in our own eyes. That you have called us into a new covenant one of your blood, one that it rests upon the cross. We ask that you are reminded to live out this covenant with you, caring for our neighbor and loving one another. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you all to stand one last time as we end our Sunday service.
Our benediction is from Luke 6, verse 35. Instead, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. If you do, you will have a great reward. You will be acting the way children of the Most High act, for he is kind to ungrateful and wicked people. Lord, we thank you for this time of gathering. We thank you that you are present with us. That no matter the age, no matter the era, that you are reminding us to love our neighbor. And we pray. Amen. Go and have a great, wonderful week. Go see.